Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. You are listening to KZT Corazon Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. In today's Bible, June 5th, 2022, this is preached by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, the last story of the last days, Luke chapter 21, verse 29 to 38. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the t leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear but my words will never disappear. Watch out! Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware, like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Men. Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach, and each evening, he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him.
You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. In today's Bible, June 5th, 2022, this is preached by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration of the autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, the last story of the last days, Luke chapter 21, verse 29 to 38. Then he gave them this illustration, notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the t- leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear but my words will never disappear. Watch out! Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware, like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Men. Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach, and each evening, he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. This morning what I'd like to do is something a little different. Instead of jumping into Romans, which we'll do after Vision Sunday, I didn't want to start and then stop, but I wanted to take today to talk to you about something that I believe every single Christian should have, not just in the back of their mind, but at the forefront concerning the shortness of our time that we're living in the last days And that at any moment, we could be gone from planet Earth by way of the rapture of the church. That Jesus Christ 
is coming back and he's coming soon. I realize that in our generation, you don't hear as much about the return of Christ as maybe previous generations. Some of that may be due to the fact that we have it better in terms of comfort. And so life is more comfortable here. And in some sense, people feel heaven can wait. As well, I think our generation has a view of history because of education, because of the access of, uh, to understanding history via the internet and other things. And so it seems like, you know what, things have been going for a long time and because it hasn't happened yet, it's not going to happen. All of that is tragic because when a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ lives in the reality, in the understanding, in the readiness that Jesus Christ could come at any moment. It changes how you live. It changes what you say. It changes what you do. It changes how you give. It changes how you serve. It changes the decisions that you make. It directs the conversations that you have with people. I can remember when I was at home and, and my mom and my sisters had gotten saved and they were at a church that spoke about the gospel and spoke about the return of Christ. I can remember my sisters telling me, and I'm saying this because some of you are talking, will talk to people and they will seem indifferent, but don't let the facade of their indifference somehow cause you to think they're not listening to what you're saying. So they tell me, you know, hey, the rapture's gonna happen and you know, you're gonna miss out and you're gonna be left behind and it's gonna be a bad deal for you. And I'd be like, hey, whatever, you know. So then I can remember one Sunday night my dad had gone to bed. My brother was doing who knows what. I'm sitting there in the house. It's dark. And not that I'm afraid of the dark, but there's nothing on TV. And my, my mom and my sisters have not come home yet. And I'm beginning to think I might have missed it. <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I, I get a little anxious because they told me I would miss it. And, you know, then all, this, all these things would happen. So I thought, you know what I need to do? I need to find out if I've missed it. I'm calling the church. So I call the church, let it ring. It rings a little bit. I'm thinking, oh no. And then all of a sudden, a man by the name of Merv, one of the top deacons, head usher, he answered the phone and said, Calvary Assembly of God. And I knew instantly, I hung up because I knew if Merv ain't going, ain't nobody going. The rapture has not happened. I am safe. I would hope to create that kind of urgency in people. Not to scare people, but I think there's something to be said for taking scripture seriously and understanding that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And so in the next few moments, we're gonna kind of take a jet tour, not through the whole second coming of Christ because that would take a long series. And if you're interested in that, you can check out Living in the Last Days, a series on YouTube that we have up and you can hear more about it. But I wanna to talk to you about specifically that part of the events of his coming called the rapture of the church. To do that, I want to focus our thoughts in four areas. First of all, I want to talk to you about the surety of his coming, that he is coming. It is a sure thing. It is going to happen. That scripture is filled with verses on his coming. In fact, the Bible talks a lot about the coming of Christ. There are over 300 verses in the Bible regarding the coming of Christ. 100 have to do with his first coming. That's what we talk about at Christmas. 200 have to do with his second coming when he's coming again. If the first coming happened, you can be sure the second coming is going to happen. When you read through the gospels, you see repeatedly Jesus talking about it. For example, in Luke chapter 12, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It, 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 nobody's going to know the day nor the hour, Jesus said. Only the father in heaven knows. Jesus doesn't know. The angels don't know. But he is 
coming. He promised the disciples in John chapter 14 with these words, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He is coming. Paul the apostle talks over and over again about his coming. When we get to Romans 13, we'll learn more about his coming and how we should live our life. He says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 a passage we're going to look at in detail in a moment. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, he is coming. James says this in James chapter five and verse eight, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Peter says this in second Peter chapter three. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Hadn't happened yet. How do we know it's going to happen? He is coming. You come to the book of Jude, verse 14. It says this, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. He is coming. You read the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's revealing Christ in all of his glory. It's talking about the events that will lead up to his literal, physical return to the earth. And at the end of it, as John looks at all of it, he's a bit overwhelmed, but Jesus wraps up the book with these words. He says, behold, I am coming soon. There's a certainty. Honestly, we could spend the entire, the entire message just simply talking about all the different places Christ says he's coming. He is coming soon. The Lord is going to return. That leads me to a second thing, the signs of his coming. The signs of his coming. Now here's what we know about the signs of his coming. That that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse eight, he talks about the signs of his coming and he says that all of these are the beginning of birth pains. What do we know about birth pains? Well, guys don't know a lot, but ladies do. And when a woman's expecting a baby, she gets close to delivering the baby, all of a sudden she has birth pains and they become more frequent and they come with greater intensity. Jesus compared the signs of his coming to a woman in labor. It's gonna start out with less pain, less frequency, less intensity, but it's going to increase. In Matthew, 24, in Mark 13, in Luke 21, we have the signs of his coming. You can see those again given to us in greater detail in the book of Revelation, starting in chapter six, these signs of his coming. As I go through them, I'm gonna go through them very very fast, but hopefully you'll understand that like birth pains, they start out small, they get bigger. Matthew Chapter 24, Jesus gives us several signs of his coming. The first one that we read is false world religions. False world religions. For many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Christ and will deceive many. It's not people saying, hey, I'm Jesus. It's people saying, hey, I'm God. And we see that all of the world religions, people vying for people's attention, world religions vying for the adoration of people, all of the false world religions saying, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. The spread of that and the notoriety of that increases. Number two, war. Matthew 24 and verse six, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Jesus is saying this to the disciples. But watch what he says, but see to it, you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What he's saying is that wars are gonna increase over time. And historically, that's proven to be true. Prior to the time of Christ, 70 known wars. Following the time of Christ in the next thousand years, 50 wars. In the next 500 years after that, 100 wars. In the next 300 years, 250 wars. In the last 200 years, 500 wars. 
In the last four years or five years, you've got 25 wars. All of that to say, like a woman in labor, there's an increasing frequency. So that by the time you get to Revelation chapter six, what you have is you have wars, you have famine, you have pestilence, you have this, and it says this, a fourth of the human race dies at the start of the tribulation. You haven't even gotten going yet. If the return of Christ is 30 years away, and in 2015, the world's population is 10 billion people, imagine 250 million people dead in a matter of two years. You're talking mass graves. You're talking cataclysm that you and I cannot comprehend. That's just wars. We go on, Jesus said this, number three, famines. There will be famines. One of the concerns is that we may outgrow by 2050 the ability to produce food for 10 billion people. And there's talk about that. There's talk about the effects of climate change. There's talk about the effects of, of, of how things are changing biologically in the plant world and the ability to produce food. Scientists are beginning to question. It's all over the internet if you look at it. Number four, pestilence. Jesus said in a parallel passage, there'll be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful events. Reach MD has this to say, epidemiologists and healthcare professionals believe it is a case of when, not if, the world is hit by a global epidemic of deadly infectious disease killing, watch this, millions of people. That as we go through time, you're going to see more and more of that. And all of science and all of technology, they're admitting, cannot stop it from happening. Imagine a worldwide pandemic that kills millions of people. It's all pointing to the return of the Lord. The world is not going to get better and better. We're not going to manage our way scientifically or technologically out of the disasters. Jesus said it. Number Five, earthquakes. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Do you realize there's 500,000 earthquakes that happen every single year? It's just that we don't feel them. We're not aware of them. And yet there are, there are places all over the globe that have fault lines, earthquakes that will happen, that will culminate in the tribulation with a massive earthquake that will level every mountain and raise up every valley. Talk about a renovation of the earth. That's in Revelation chapter 16, earthquakes. And then persecution of Christians. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Do you realize that we're living in a day when more people are persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ than ever before? Do you realize in the last century, more people were martyred for their faith than all the previous centuries combined? Do you realize that right now, people are dying for their faith? Listen to this. One, of the th one in three Christians face high levels of persecution in Asia. I was talking today with India entering the top 10 for the first time. Open Doors estimates that 245 million Christians worldwide face high levels of persecution this year. What year is it? 2019. Up from 215 million last year. 215, 245 now. Increasing persecution of believers. Jesus also predicted that the, the love of many would grow cold, that there would be a falling away. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, that people would go from being on fire for the Lord to being lukewarm. Even as people are getting saved, that's going to happen. And then we read this. I think this is one of the great signs of his coming. The gospel will be preached to the world. Jesus said in this gospel of the kingdom, as he's giving signs, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, 
and then the end will come. I think this is the single most significant sign of all of the ones that Jesus listed. You say, why is that? Because if you were to go to a place like the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., I was there the first week in January. They've got this room, and in this room, they've got all of the spoken languages on planet Earth, and then what they have is, if that language has a complete Bible, they've got a book that's a certain color for that language. It's got a complete Bible. Then if there's languages that only have like the New Testament, they've got a, a, a different color they use to mark those languages. And then if there are languages that maybe only have like a gospel or have a part of the New Testament, they have another color. And then they have hundreds of books where there are spoken languages that do not have the gospel in written form. This is what the executive director told me. By 2030, 11 years from now, every single spoken language on planet Earth will have a, the, the gospel itself in their language, translated. That's amazing. I'm not setting dates. Because you can have the gospel translated, but somebody's got to hear it. And how can they hear unless they're sent? And we get that, don't we? I'm just simply saying, never in the history of the world have we had the word of God or the capacity, the capability to give the word of God to every language group. I'm telling you, Jesus said this gospel will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. We're living in the last days. We're living close to the time of the Lord's return. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. And he is coming soon. If the apostles thought he might come in their lifetime, how much more would we in our lifetime understand that we are close to the time of the Lord's coming? Yes. Jesus also said this. Another reason, another sign that right before he comes, it'd be like the days of Noah. What does that mean, the days of Noah? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Then he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What, what, are, what are we talking about? What was it like? Well, there was rampant godlessness. But it's interesting that Genesis chapter 6, and I realize I'm moving a bit into speculation, but I think it's not, it's not totally unwarranted. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, when men began to increase in number on the earth, this is the start of the account of Noah. And daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they married any of them they chose. Now, this is not uniformly accepted by, by commentators or theologians, but there are many who would share my opinion on this. That what you have happening here is you have the sons of God, fallen angels, cohabiting with the daughters of men creating a super race. You say, where, where, where do you get that validated? You can read about it in Jude. Angels who abandon their place of authority, their sphere, are kept in everlasting chains. Peter mentions it as well. It's also, and it's cast in terms of the days of Noah. When God sees that, if that is, if that is correct, and I believe it is, when the Lord saw that, watch his response. The Lord said, my spirit will not contend with men forever. God says, that, that's not happening. Then it reiterates it. It says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Who are the Nephilim? They're the giants. Men of renown. It says, were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men, had children by them, they were the heroes of old, the men of of renown. So there's wickedness all over the earth. There is this different kind of human race. And God says, enough's enough. The days of Noah, when God destroyed the earth by water, are considered an example of God's judgment, both on mankind and on the earth. And Peter makes a correlation between the days of Noah and the end times when the earth will be destroyed by fire. I'm simply saying that as people begin to mess with the human genome and DNA, the idea of a super race 
is now being openly discussed. It was theorized by Stephen Hawking, who certainly was not a Christian in his perspective, but he wrote this, and these essays, essays were released last fall. Among them, I'm sure that during this century, people will discover how to modify both intelligence and instincts, such as aggression. Laws will probably be passed. This is Stephen Hawking writing against genetic engineering with humans. But some people won't be able to resist the temptation to improve human characteristics such as memory, resistance to disease, length of life. Once such superhumans appear, there will be significant political problems with unimproved humans. That's you and me. Turn to your neighbor and say, sorry, you're unimproved. <laughs> Who won't be able to compete. Presumably, they will die out or become unimportant. Instead, there'll be a race of self-designing beings who are improving at an ever-increasing rate. So says theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking. You say, well, is that really happening? A month after that was released, NPR did an interview where Chinese researchers claiming to have created the world's first genetically edited human babies. The Chinese are already unrestricted by laws that might govern Western civilization using DNA editing to create a superhuman race. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I'm not setting dates, I'm just simply saying that our world is embracing things that go to the very core of what it means to be human and to be made in the image of God. Certainly that would make any person think that we're moving closer to the return of Christ, signs of his coming, cataclysms that will happen. What do we know about those signs? We know this, that they become more and more frequent, more and more severe, so that by the time you get into the book of Revelation, you get to the middle of the tribulation, you have a third of the world's water supply, fresh water ruined, a third of the seawater ruined, a third of the fish dying, a third of the vegetation gone. You have the earth literally on fire, burning up. It will make what we think of as global warming look weak. Certainly, even the discussion of climate change, regardless of what you think about it, simply highlights the fact that the earth is changing signs of his coming. By the time you get to the end of the tribulation, that seven year period, you've got the whole earth messed up. The sun goes hot and then goes dark. You've got all the water supply ruined, all of the plant life gone. You say, how will people will, will survive? Jesus said this, if the days had not been cut short, no one would have survived. I'm just simply saying, these are signs of his coming. That leads me to the third thing, the sequence of his coming. The sequence of his coming. Uh, how do we understand all of these things? Well, the coming of the Lord or what the Old Testament calls the day of the Lord, and even Paul would reference it as the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, is, is not so much one event as a sequence of events that culminate ultimately in a new heaven and a new earth. But along the way, you have a literal return of Jesus to the earth where he will rule and reign, the Bible says, for a thousand years. He will fulfill every promise that he ever made to national Israel. But prior to that, seven years before that, is an event whereby Jesus doesn't come to the earth, but he simply comes in the clouds and pulls all the Christians out of the earth. Right now, Christians are a restraining influence for evil in the earth. You take the Christians out of the earth, the world radically changes. You add to that the fact that at the start of the tribulation, there are demons, Revelation 9, who are chained in a, a place called the abyss. They will be released and Satan himself will be confined, Revelation chapter 12, to the earth for a three and a half year period. And you're talking a demonic free-for-all 
that is more hellish than you and I can imagine. But at the start of that seven year period is a thing called the rapture of the church. It's called the blessed hope. That Jesus Christ is gonna keep his promise that he's prepared a place for us. And if he prepared a place for us, he's gonna come and take us that where he is, there we may be also. It's called the rapture of the church. Here's what's very interesting is the apostle Paul talked about it a lot. He's at, he's with the Thessalonians. He's only there, scholars tell us, two weeks. But while he's there two weeks, he's giving them the basics of the Christian faith. And one of the basics he gives them is this teaching on the rapture of the church. And he makes it so glorious, so real to them that now when he's gone, they've got questions. So he writes them for Thessalonians and answers some of their questions relative to the rapture. How important then is this doctrine for you and I to understand? That if Paul only has two weeks with somebody, he's going to talk about this. It's imperative that every single follower of the Lord Jesus Christ understands this this doctrine, this teaching, this principle of scripture called the rapture of the church. Let's look at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. When he talks about people who fall asleep, he's not talking about people who sleep in church, although I know there are some who do. And I say, hey, one way or another, you're getting something good out of the service. I can remember in my first church, see about 150 people. The vice chairman of the board, about three rows back, he utilized every single service as an opportunity to take a nap, and he was loud. I mean, it was people were looking at him, looking at me, and I I was ornery a time or two, but tried to control myself, knowing that he was the vice chairman of the board. But he's not talking about people who fall asleep, he's talking about people who have died. It's a euphemism. The word there for that uh, is translated sleep there. We get our word cemetery from it. What happens is the soul doesn't sleep, but the body, when a Christian dies, their body, as it were, sleeps. It's, It's a temporary repose, if you will, while their spirit is with the Lord. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. So the minute a believer dies, their their soul is in heaven. They're with the Lord, beholding the glory, but they they don't have the body that they will have for all eternity. That is yet to come at that moment of the rapture. But they they sleep, their body sleeps. You see this used in early church uh, writing like Acts chapter six and or chapter seven and verse sixty where we're reading about Stephen, one of the first martyrs in the church, and he cried out as they're stoning him, they're killing him, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. His body went into repose. His spirit went to be with the Lord. Verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Your participation, my participation in the rapture is based on believing Jesus died for our sin and he rose again. It's, It's based on are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that you've been born again, that you've been saved, that, that you put your faith in Christ to save you from your sin, to do for you what you could never do for yourself. Once you've done that, watch, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Watch, with Jesus. They're with Jesus in heaven. So their soul is up there. Their soul is going to come down with him and their body's going to be resurrected. Watch this, verse 15. According to the Lord's own word. In other words, this is something that Paul has directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. We tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. You say, what's going to happen? Verse 16, for the Lord himself 
will come down from heaven. Why is he coming down from heaven? Because that's where he's at. He's coming down and watch this. It says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. The word is keluzma in the Greek. It's, it's a military term. It, Martin Luther, the reformer, translated it using a German word that means stand up, fall in, attention. We don't know exactly what's the word is that Jesus is going to use. We do know from his ministry, remember in John chapter 11, he's standing near the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus has been dead for four days. He has him open the tomb and he cries out, the Bible says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, a dead man coming back to life. Some scholars have theorized that it's a good thing he, he specified Lazarus because if he had just said come forth, you'd had like this mass resurrection. So maybe, maybe the Lord himself descends. Says my people come forth. What else happens? And the voice of the archangel. We don't know what the archangel does. There's his voice sounds. You say, who is the archangel? Well, two of them are named in scripture. Perhaps three, if you look at Jewish writing, there's, there's um, Michael. We read about him in Jude 9. There's Gabriel, who made the announcement to Mary and, and to Zechariah. There's Ariel. So there's a Jewish writing says there's seven archangels, each of their names ending in L, which is the, the word of God. We don't know what Michael does. We just know this when we read the book of Revelation that any time a mighty angel opens his mouth and talks, it's like the thunder of many waters. It's loud, it's, it's impressive. Jesus comes, gives us, and Michael thunders, or Gabriel thunders. Watch what else happens. And with the trumpet call of God. When God came down on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, there were trumpet blasts. It was, it was God's way of assembling the people. That's what the trumpet call is all about. You read in the book of Numbers that God said, make some trumpets and when you give these certain blasts, that will uh, be a sign for the people to assemble or to move out. And so on that day, that moment, Jesus is gonna come down. He's gonna give a, a cry of command and the, the voice of the archangel is gonna thunder and there's gonna be this trumpet blast and I believe all creation will hear it. The saved and the unsaved. The unsaved may not understand it unless they've heard teaching on it, then they will know, but it will be instantaneous. Watch this. It says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, go back to 1 Corinthians. Talking about this, Paul's talking about that same moment. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. So in the time it takes for light to reflect off your eye, you're changed. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. That means they'll be given a brand new body, a resurrection body, and we will be changed. Uh, Paul will say later, mortality will take on immortality. Instantly, you have a, a different body. But it all happens very quickly. You say, why is that? Because this is a rescue operation, if you will. I mean, this is Jesus coming for his own. And Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And Satan doesn't know the day or the hour. You can believe if he knew. You can believe if he had any awareness. You, believe, you can believe that he would try to stop it. But this is Jesus coming for his own. And he will not be detoured. It will be sudden. It will be quick. It will be powerful. It will be done in a fraction of a second. Back to 1 Thessalonians. And the dead in Christ will rise first. You say, why is that? 
because they have six more feet to go. And after that, we who are still alive and are left, it's going to be awesome. I hope when it happens, I'm near a cemetery. Wouldn't that be cool? Watch all these people standing up out of their graves, their body instantly resurrected. They're going up. Then I'm going up. You're going up if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. People say, well, you know, John, you're talking about the rapture, but that word is not in the Bible. Well, the word caught up, harpazo in the Greek, translated in the Latin Vulgate translation that Jerome did in the fourth century, uses the word that we get our word rapture from. It means a violent, forceful catching away. I mean, it is, it is jolting. And you're caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and the bodies resurrected and the souls reunited and you and I in the presence of Jesus and you and I with the people that we love, that we grieved when we, when we saw them pass away. Suddenly we're all together and the Bible says this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You say, what will happen? The Bible says he's going to take us back to heaven and he's prepared a feast. He tells a parable about how, how he will wait and serve on us. And then in Revelation 19, you have, you have an expansion of that theme as we're all together in the presence of the Lord. And there are shouts and hallelujahs. And we sit at a great banqueting table and celebrate the greatest family reunion history's ever seen as we're in the presence of the Lord. That leads us to the final thing. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. Let's call this our service until his coming. Well, Peter says, saying that these things, that we know these things, what kind of people should we be? He says in 2 Peter, we should walk in all godliness and holiness is the way Peter puts it. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he's continuing this theme of the day of the Lord and talking to the Thessalonians. And he says this in chapter 5 and verse 6, so then let us not be like others who are asleep. In other words, they're spiritually dead. You know, it, it's a sign of spiritual deadness when a person isn't thinking about being ready for the coming of Jesus. When a person knows the Lord and they're not living in that reality, that awareness that he could come at any moment, it causes them to act at times and in ways as if they're not spiritually alive, though they may be. He says, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert. Let us be watching, that's the idea. Let us be watching. We're like a, a watchman watching. Let's be aware that we're living in the last days. You know what? It, it, as I said at the start, it will change how you live. It'll change some of what you do. It'll change how you give. Listen, if, if, if you knew in 30 days or 365 days, Jesus is returning, how would you live? How would you give? Who would you talk to? Where would you be? What would you do? I can assure you it motivates you in a whole lot of ways. It motivates you to have some conversations with people who don't know Jesus that need to know about Jesus. It would motivate you in what you do in the offering and the way you give in the offering and not only what you give, how much you give. It would motivate you in how you serve and it would certainly motivate you in how you attend church and it would motivate you in the way you lived your life. It would motivate you in what you watched and what you read. It would draw you closer to Jesus. That's why Paul is saying, let us be alert. 
You'd walk in a greater purity. John says this in 1 John 3 and verse 3, and every man who has this hope in him keeps himself pure, even as he is pure. In other words, there's a lot of things you wouldn't do if you thought Jesus was gonna come while you were doing them. He goes on and says, let us be self-controlled. So self-control, interestingly, is mentioned twice because self-control is a real big issue. Saying no to things you should say no to, saying yes to things you should say yes to, ultimately comes down to controlling your emotions, controlling your time, controlling what you think, controlling your priorities. Be self-controlled. Putting on faith. Believing God, believing his word, standing for the truth at all times and balancing that with the love that keeps us from being obnoxious, right? So we speak the truth in love. We tell people in love, we live in love, kindly, gently loving people, but not compromising the faith either in what we say or in how we live. He says, if we, if we put on faith and love as a breastplate, picturing a Roman soldier covering their vital organs that they might be protected against the, the, the blows of the, the spear or the arrows. You know what, when you, when you cover your heart with faith, the faith of God's word, and faith that says, I believe God's word personally, it has a protecting effect. It covers that which is vital to you. You cover your heart, you cover your, your being with love. Lord, let me live in love. Let me walk in love. Let me serve in love. Let me love people. Even people who hate me, let me love them. And then he says, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. The hope of salvation, what is the hope of salvation? He's coming. He's coming. Wear that, cover your mind with that. Think about it. Consider it, where you're going, what's gonna happen. I've said it before John Bunyan in writing that great book, Pilgrim's Progress, that allegory of the Christian life. Christian asks one of his friends, when do you find yourself in the most vigorous state? And he said, the friend says, when I think of that place to which I am going. Something about thinking about heaven that makes heaven real. Something about thinking about the return of Christ that automatically straightens up the priorities of our life to align them with God's word. Jesus said, behold, I am coming soon. We're living in the last days. Are you looking for his coming? And are you ready for his coming?